So in terms of uh, Columbia Threadneedle, where do we sit in? So you've heard from Fraser from the Embark side, you've heard from Salman about e-value. What we do as, a, a, as the asset manager is we manage around those strategic asset allocations. So you can see uh, below on the table the allocation allowances. So what we aim to do is we aim to add value firstly from tactically uh, allocating around this strategic asset allocation. And then secondly, we aim to uh, add further value from our security selection across fixed income, equities, etc. So let's have a look at our investment process very quickly, just to give you an idea of how we come to these decisions and then the investment team, and then we'll talk about what's been happening in markets. So firstly, our investment process is a three stage investment process. The first part of that process is all about firm wide research. So that comes in in terms of the economic research group with who's tasked with what's going to happen next in the real world. So ignoring markets for the moment, what's going to happen in terms of GDP. So what we thinking, we're thinking about what we think is going to happen this year and next year. Uh, so are we going to enter into a V-shaped recovery? So V-shaped recovery for us would be, we would see at the end of 2021, what we saw economic growth by the end of 2019. A U-shaped would be uh, by the end of 2022, we would have uh, uh, the economic growth in 2019. And we saw, uh, in fact, from the, the Fed last night that they are expecting on our measure more of a U-shaped recovery. However, uh, if you think about what the ECB have been saying in terms of their economic projections, then they're looking for an L-shape. And that L-shape is anything past 2023. So this uh, economic research group, what they're doing is they collate all the investment teams come in and we think about what GDP is going to be, what earnings are going to be. And then we think about the valuation research group, which is a smaller subset. And those are tasked with what's in the price. Then the sector on themes, and that's thinking about long term structural themes. Those all feed into the asset allocation strategy group. This group identifies what uh, investment regime we're in what our asset class preferences are, so do we like equities? And then within equities, what regions do we prefer? We then implement this through an, our own internal funds, and that gives us the benefit of full look through from the bottom up, from an ESG and a risk perspective. In terms of the team, uh, we manage over 100 billion in active asset allocation mandates. So the left-hand side shows this, asset allocation team, which is a large team. In the centre, we've got the portfolio manager, Alex Lyle, and the deputy, Matt Reese. Alex has been with the firm for uh, over 40 years now. In fact, he's been with the firm longer than the firm's been in existence. So you'll see Alex on the left-hand side in the centre and also part of that asset allocation strategy group, which is on the right-hand side. Importantly for this group, it consists of people from within asset allocation and also out with. So we've got Adrian Hilton, Head of Rates and Currency, Ali Ross, Head of Investment Grade, William Davis, CIO of uh, the EMEA Business and Global Head of Equities, and then Paul Doyle, Senior Equ Equity Fund Manager. So what we're doing as a group, we're meeting on a weekly basis and we're thinking about what are our views over the next 12 to 18 months. So let's take a step back and think about what we've seen historically. So what's happened is, well, we've had a significant period of volatility. Uh, on the left hand side, we look at in the green line uh, VIX or equity volatility and in the blue line, which is on the right hand side of the, gra the graph is currency volatility and you can see both actually increase quite dramatically over March and in fact, volatility uh, VIX was at its highest ever level in, in, the, in March this year, even higher than what we saw in the global financial crisis. You see volatility has reduced. It's down to uh, still elevated levels compared to what we've been used over the, the previous couple, couple of years, but it has came down quite dramatically. And in fact, it's not just equities, not just currency, but we've saw the volatility in corporate spreads as well, where they have been significant widening, but they have been more tightening more recently. 
So we've saw volatility increasing. The second thing that we also saw was uh, actually correlations increasing. What this graph looks at is correlations to corporate fixed income and government fixed income to global equities. This is not really a huge surprise in that you would expect corporate fixed income to have some degree of correlation to equities. And you can see that that's quite consistent right throughout. However, over March, those correlations increased quite dramatically and increased to the highest level that we've seen over the previous 20 years. They've came down slightly and then even further, if you look at these, the, the safe assets like government bonds, they became from negative correlation to actually slight positive or well, no correlation to slightly positive correlation. So even during the crisis, you had very little hiding places from some of your fixed income assets as well. So we've seen vol volatility increasing, we've seen correlations increasing. The other thing that we've seen is that there's been a huge economic impact. We've updated this right to, to uh, as, as the most recent data that we've got. And you can see PMIs, our Purchasing Managers Index PMIs, have fallen through the floor. Uh, the way that you read this is anything above 50, uh, we're in expansion anything below 50 we're in contraction you can see that PMIs across the board have cratered they are even lower than what we've seen over the previous 20 years this fall has been dramatic it's basically what governments have done is they've shut down large parts of the economy where they have chosen the health of us all rather than our wealth and that's quite quite rightly so you can see if you squint quite uh, uh, on the left hand side this little uptick and that's Chinese PMI. So Chinese PMIs have recovered and they are above 50 now. But you can see uh, if you look at the uh, the developed world uh, across UK, Europe, US, they are still at very, very low levels. And you can see on the right hand side where what we're looking at here is US jobless claims. The top graph looks right through uh, the longest period that we have and you can see uh, around about 1982, well it was 1982, the previous high in jobless claims was 692,000. Over the global financial crisis we lost around about uh, 11 million jobs. The chart below is still the US jobless claims but what we do is we bring that right up to date so including the impact of what we've seen from uh, from COVID-19. And it actually dwarfs anything that we saw his historically. And in fact, we're over four times the amount of jobless claims that we saw in the, in the global financial crisis. So that impact has been quite significant. The second thing that we know is the policy response has been enormous. It's been huge. Uh, it's, it, it's dwarfed anything that we've seen uh, over the global financial crisis in terms of speed and in terms of uh, sheer monetary amount. Where governments and central banks or central bank, well, governments were really tasked with the focus of making sure that when we eventually slowly uh, come from lockdown that people still have roles and jobs to go to. While central banks, what they were doing is they were trying to guard against financial system collapse. They were pumping money into the system to make sure that those fixed income markets that Salman indicated were really struggling from liquidity had money behind them and we've even saw this week the ECB have announced a, what another 600 billion into the PEPP and then a 12-month extension so what we're seeing is unbelievable amount of credit support and government support from uh, from central banks and governments to make sure that we can continue to function so this the policy response has been huge and all about supporting the economy so what does that mean uh, for our asset allocation view. So this is again right bang up to date. What we've been doing over this time is we've taken Japanese equities down from uh, favour to, to neutral and we've done that right at the end of March. And the reason that we did that is we were adding to Japanese equities over March. The valuation research group that we're talking about they typically look at earnings but in this type of environment earnings aren't really a good 
valuation measure because people really don't know what earnings are. So what we're looking at is price the book. Price the book, so traditional measures are thinking about how much our company's worth. And those indicated that Japanese equities looked attractive. So what we're doing over March is we're building into Japanese equities to the fact that Japanese equities significantly outperformed their global counterparts, outperformed by over double digits. And so what we did is we, we, we reduced our Japanese equity position. They still look relatively attractive, not as attractive as they were when we were adding. We still believe in the corporate governance story. But the reason that we were, we were actually cutting Japanese equities is that Japanese companies are very linked to the global economy. And we all know what we saw in Q1 and we saw the Q2 uh, and how fallen, how, how, how we were actually expecting them to fall. So those pressures we felt would be a disadvantage to Japanese equities. So what we did is we reduced that allocation. And where we and uh, added to, we added to US equities. We added we strongly to, to favour on the 21st of April. And basically what we're looking for there is those quality companies that you just simply don't get anywhere else. Those compounding companies that continue to grow no matter what. So we, we, we have been adding to US equities and where we've been really funding that from is UK. So UK equities, we, we had started to get a favourable view towards the end of last year. As the Conservative government came in power, we knew that the, that, that the majority gave them five years of, of political stability. We knew the direction of travel for the uh, EU and Brexit. We were hoping for uh, economic stability, earning stability, and importantly, this Brexit discount that has been building up as UK companies have been underperforming their global counterparts on a like for like basis would narrow. Given everything that's happened, we don't think that this Brexit discount will actually narrow. And in fact, you've seen headlines that the Brexit negotiations have gone no further. So we have one more round. After that round, we either need to ask for an extension or we will be out by the end of the year. And it looks so far as if we will be out by the end of the year. In terms of the corporate investment grade, I'm going to come back to that and I'll tell you why we've moved to strongly favour in a couple of slides time. But firstly, let's think about equities and why uh, we've been favouring equities. So well, within the firm, we have a quality approach. Uh, within equities. A quality approach means what we're looking for is we're looking for those strong companies, strong balance sheets that tend to continue to, to uh, gain market share and continue to, to compound. And those are companies like Mastercard, like Amazon, like Alphabet, people that those companies that we always continue to use. And so we're, we're really happy with this quality approach. This approach will not, uh, will perform positively in all manners, but where it will significantly underperform or where it will underperform is if we have a V-shaped recovery. And that V-shaped recovery means that uh, we'll get a, 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 a vaccine, everyone goes back to work very quickly, Econ economies will go, and that type of environment will mean that we will see, um, uh, uh, um, we will see that uh, value type companies will outperform. That won't suit us. Those low uh, value type companies will outperform. Uh, and so we, we have a more quality approach. Uh, within fixed income, uh, as I mentioned, we don't like government bonds. Uh, we don't think government bonds are in a bubble. Uh, rather, the, the uh, starting yield is very low and offers poor risk adjusted returns going forward. And so they are very low. We don't believe that the yields are going to move anywhere short, uh, in the next foreseeable future and you can see that on the right hand side. The right hand side looks at UK LIBOR, US fund rates. The, the uh, dark purple line is where rates are and you can see they're at low levels. The light blue and light purple are where market expects them to be at the end of 2020, 2021. And you can see there are nothing priced in in terms of rate movements over the next couple of years. 
<clears throat> I promise I'll talk about uh, credit, and here is where I'm going to talk about credit. We have started to move more positive on credit over this period. Why? Because you can see what happened within spreads. Spreads over government bonds, over UK investment grade, uh, went from over 100 over to 200 over. They've came back slightly to about 150 over, and you can see uh, in terms of high, high yield, they went up to 900 over. Let's think about this in context. This spread movement across investment grade, uh, global, European, actually indicated that corp default levels on corporate bonds would be in the region of about 25%. We've never seen that type of default expectations over the, over the, the, the or actual levels over the past 100 years. So while we expect default to increase, I think everyone would agree with that. The fact that that level of compensation and the fact that we talked about those central banks and that level of support uh, that they've been giving led us to believe that that was an, a very attractive asset class to invest in. So what we've been doing is we've been adding to uh, corporate investment grade. And that has traditionally been from our government bonds. So, so those government bonds rallied. We started moving, switching, started further lowering our allocations to government bonds and adding to credit. So what does that mean in terms of portfolio? Salmon has covered this. So I'm not going to dwell on that. But in terms of positioning right to the end of May, you can see that the, the, the overall allocations. And it's not really surprising what we're doing here. We're underweight government bonds across UK and across global government bonds that were recently added. We're overweight corporate bonds in portfolios one, two and three, where they're more defensive. Portfolio four, we're underweight corporate bonds because that we don't, there isn't an allocation, strategic asset allocation to, to government bonds. And where we're overweight, you can see our favoured regions are US equities, and emerging market equities. So that Asia element that we were talking about. So what we're doing is we're favoring the, the regions that we think are going to be the strongest returns. So the US and Asia through our uh, emerging markets and we're underweight property and cash. And so what this, what Fraser talked about right at the start is the full process. And this is the benefit of this process. Fraser indicated he showed the five funds and he said that over 30, so over the six years, six calendar years, 29 of those instances, these funds have been in, in, in the top quartile. In fact, all 30 have been in the top half. So those top quartile performance, you think over 90% have been top quartile. So you can imagine what the longer term three and five years are. If you're consistently adding over once every calendar year. And this is the benefit of these funds. These funds benefit from the Embark Overview, the strategic asset allocation undertaken by E-Value, and then our tactical element, our tactical element of adding from asset allocation and also from the stock selection.